I recently visited the first showroom for 3D printed houses in the US. The store is at an outdoor mall in Melbourne, Florida. It's owned by Apiscore or Apiscore. It can be pronounced either way. So we are with Trevor Ragnar, Director of Construction at Apiscore. So thanks for having us. First of all, this showroom is absolutely awesome. Tell us a little bit more about the Frank printer that you'll have. It's very different than all the other gantry systems I've seen. Yeah, yes. Um, thank you so much for coming in today. The technology itself, we really developed this for the construction site. It was very purpose-built to be mobile, to tackle a lot of the challenges that you see when operating in that really unique environment. Sometimes when you adapt existing technology to a new environment, you inherit some of the old ailments of that technology. So some of those things might be the setup, uh, which can be very time consuming and in some cases with many gantry printers, for example. We like to think about it as the atoms cost. So that's additional site costs, transportation, operation costs, maintenance and depreciation, and then setup. Some of those additional site costs are things like footers or large slab aprons. So those are all these things that you'll identify very early on in the yes. development stage. And mm -hmm. you all said the gantry system is not where we want to head down. We want to head down a mobile, well, fixed at first and now <laughs> mobile printer. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so um, being able to very quickly deploy, really coming fully assembled, so there's no assembly required on site, and um, being able to very easily print either a small building or a very large building without needing to change out your equipment or go through a, you know, a strenuous setup cost once again. And with some of these other printers, it, it seems very difficult, if not impossible, to print a building larger than the printer itself. So the Frank printer not only moves up and down like an accordion, but the arm actually extends out. Vertically, we're able to get the extruder 10 and a half feet off the floor level. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can only print 10 and a half feet high. Uh, we set the Guinness World Record for the largest 3D printed building on Earth, and that's about 32 feet high overall. Um, you're able to do that by moving the printer to a subsequent floor or driving it up onto a pedestal to print higher walls. Um, now, to be able to do this, you really have to also maintain a good center of gravity because one thing is print height, but another thing is your print radius, which we have about a 16 and a half foot uh, print radius. In order to extend the printer to 16 and a half feet, the robot has heavy counterweights on either side that move as needed. The electronic control unit, or ECU, also acts like a counterweight. This box is the brain of the concrete printer. It is lifted off the ground to protect it from moisture and even falling objects. So in this next generation of the Frank printer, y'all added something extremely important, and that's sensors. Yes, absolutely. So some of these sensors have to do with preventative maintenance, things like rust detection, like a check engine light come, might come on before your car decides to die on you. Well, we want to make sure that we can tell what things might be over a long time in the field eventually degrading so we could do preventative maintenance on something like that. In the case of the extruder up here, we also have an obstacle avoidance system. So the extruder is what's really doing a lot of the movement around the site. If a collision event were to happen, then we want to make sure that that operator is kept safe and also that the machine is kept safe. This assembly also allows us to, when enough force is applied, deflect and that deflection allows the operator, it pauses the printing, a splash screen on the operator, uh, on the operator's tablet comes up saying that there's been an obstacle of, uh, detected, would you like to proceed? This kind of reminds me of the saw stop table saws, like the, <laughs> yeah, the so moment it finger. touches something, it just completely uh, retracts and, and stops the blade immediately, so it mm -hmm. prevents, I mean, you can, it barely cuts your finger. It, yes. Well, Incredible. construction sites, to that point, are typically a very, it's a difficult, dirty, and dangerous environment. Yeah. And being able to help make that safer for people to uh, kind of be involved with really could help bring new entrants and, and bring new people into the industry to build homes. We think if this is a, a better experience you're having while you're doing what you're doing, your job, then... You'd be more likely to use it again Yeah, exactly, again. exactly. Um, safety, it's no accident. It really does take planning, preparation, and um, you know foresight, but it kind of even bridges the gap beyond that to also helping you in the very unique and um, sometimes challenging environment that is construction. 
this extruder is very different than the other 3D printing extruders I've seen. It's first of all, it's a square nozzle mm -hmm. rather than a round nozzle. And I know you also have a flap system now on the yes. new versions of these. So how did you develop these? So yeah, a really great question. Um, you know, the extruder, when it comes to precisely extruding the material, making sure that the walls are uniform and consistent, we found that a, a smooth print finish, a good facade on the building is really important. Um, part of that comes into effect with the square extruding nozzle where the material coming out instead of being circular that might create that that sausage you already have a flat edge that immediately as it's coming out you already start out with a pretty flat element uh, the smoothing spatula will come down during the envelope printing to help smooth the exterior surfaces um, on interior corners it'll lift up and then cut back in after it turns the corner to help a nice crisp line and it, it really also helps um, create more surface area that bonds between layers so when you think of a, a sausage or rounded layer all of that material was extruded you invested in that material to go into the house but it's not making contact with the layers above or below it so by squeezing that material in on layers above and below you're able to create more surface area uh, more contact surface area and um, really improve overall quality of the print. Um, so the parallels between 3D printing and CME block walls are not just like in the modular aspect, but mm -hmm. also in the lifts, correct? Absolutely, yes. So when we're printing, we're, we're printing about 20 millimeters high per layer, but when you're imagining how this is being reinforced, let's say horizontally, things like ladder wire, We'll still do that, let's say, uh, with a concrete block home, you'd have to insert ladder wire every 16 inches. Here, we'll still install it every 16 inches. With, with block, it's because it's between two courses of block, but to mimic that, we still do the same thing right here. Um, that way, you could essentially modify a set of engineering documents or plans from a traditional concrete block home directly to a 3D printed home. Things like electrical work and plumbing and drains and all that, all that is installed after the walls are printed and cured. You come in with the saw, cut through the concrete. Very good question. Have you all considered installing sleeves during the printing process? Yes, yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of advantages that people have seen and that's why some people have used sleeves or uh, almost like a cookie cutter insert that you're able to install into the wall. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that the actual quality of the finished print, once you do that, there's inherently some, um, there could be some deformation that might occur or the, the edges leading up to that outlet box hole it's that you put in. It's not as clean. That, that's one thing, but also we're big on standardization. If you don't do it with a CMU block home, then don't do it with a 3D printed home. So there's codes for how you penetrate the building's envelope. We want to follow those. So. Uh, ideally, four to 12 hours after the layers have been printed. Um, the material is hard to the touch, but it's still more easily machinable. Uh, more time that passes, the harder it gets. So yeah, something like an oscillating multi-tool with a grout bit, we can very easily buzz in a hole, set an outlet box in place, an old work outlet box. And um, I I'm not a licensed electrician, so I'm not allowed to put the wire inside but in many places I'm allowed to install the outlet box in the conduit so the electrician can snake that in. As a printer operator, most of my time is spent sitting in a lawn chair watching Frank do what he does, only to stand up for integrating you know, some ladder wire every now and then. So I'm a big fan of the either the smoothened printed concrete or even the raw sausage look, but I know most people out there aren't. They prefer something smoother or something with the cladding, and that's all possible with 3D printing technology. Yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of the wall texture, yeah, we, we have seen that a lot of people do like a more smooth and uniform texture. Of course, you could program it in such a way where the spatula doesn't go down, but in most cases, people do want to have that smooth finish. If you want a perfectly smooth, almost drywall-like finish, then you can add something like a smooth stucco or plaster. The good thing about the texture once smoothed here is that you're able to adhere that stucco without something like a metal lath. And you can use a very thin amount of plaster or stucco. Because you, there are less yeah. voids to fill. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you aren't oh. filling these deep grooves. We have tile people see this all the time, they go, wow, this would be so easy to lay tile on because 
uh, it's when it comes out of the extruder and smoothed, there are still very fine lines in there, and that's something that does provide a great substrate to uh, adhere uh, other finishings. Uh, things like you know this facade, where you might have a stone facade or a brick facade, for example. This could be something done on interiors of houses. Many people think you know the interiors will keep those walls smooth, and exteriors we might leave them with a little bit more of a raw texture. Uh, again, uh, so much about this industry and what we see the potential for this technology is is just really creative design freedom. Part of that comes into to play with the shape and size of the walls, but also how you personalize those walls and really make it feel like home. So if you all are around Melbourne, Florida, be sure to stop by at the Apiscore showroom over here. It's an awesome place. You get to see your 3D printer firsthand and learn more about the, the actual prints. Um, but if you all can't make it, definitely go to the Apiscore University online. There are plenty of courses you all have up there, right? Absolutely, yes. It's a really great resource for people who are just kind of interested in the technology, maybe don't have much experience, all the way up to uh, you know a seasoned developer, builder, architect, or engineer. So thanks again for having us at your showroom. Really appreciate it. This place is awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing all the other new homes and the new printers you all come up with in the future. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. It's been such a great experience. We love your channel. And um, thank, you. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. <laughs>